It's been a while. So, the French kings. For a long time I didn't know how to tackle the subject because the Carolingian dynasty is kind of a mess. Luckily, one subscriber helped a lot by sending an actual list, which greatly simplifies things, though there's a few differences from the list he sent and the list I'll be doing. For this one I'm starting with Pepin the Short all the way to Napoleon III, though I'm not doing certain figures whose reigns are disputed. So while this list has Napoleon I and Napoleon III, it doesn't have Napoleon II, just as an example. Also, I'm sorry Charles Martel, you just barely don't make it. You're unquestionably one of the greatest figures in medieval history, but you weren't a king. Now, here we go. 54. Charles the Mad He seemed capable at the start, then he went completely bonkers. He attacked his own men, nearly got himself burned alive, would sometimes forget who he was or what he was doing, would sometimes forget who he was or what he was doing, would sometimes forget who he was or what he was doing, refused to bathe or change his clothes for months, and thought he was made of glass. As far as insane European monarchs go, I'll go out on a limb and say Charles VI is probably the first person you'll think of. But he's not a bad king for being insane. He's a bad king because all the good progress made by his father was essentially undone. The Duchy of Burgundy, though technically a vassal to France, became a rival to the French crown, and the Battle of Agincourt left to Charles VI sign a humiliating treaty which disinherited his son and would make England essentially the winner of the Hundred Years' War, had not said son been quite capable himself. We'll get to him much later. Also, France lost Paris. As you can see, he isn't the worst king on the list for being insane. The madness is just cherry on top. 53. Charles the Fat Briefly reunited the Carolingian Empire as he was already king of Italy and East Francia. Was a pretty weak, spineless and incompetent king, got deposed in all three kingdoms and dropped dead three months later. Good riddance. 52. John the Good Called the Good, but he was not good. His reign may have been difficult with the Black Death, rebellions and Hundred Years War and all, but he did not exactly make the best out of a bad situation. In fact, he made it worse. What kind of moron willingly returns to being held captive by his mortal enemies? 51. Louis XV The successor to Louis XIV, Louis XV's reign was also incredibly long. However, it was not quite as successful, with France having gone through the Seven Years' War in his reign, which led to France losing its territories in North America. And when he died, France was in dire need of financial and political reform. Also, he did give away the French Netherlands, but at least he added the Duchy of Lorraine and Corsica to his kingdom. I still don't really understand why would one ally with your biggest historical rival on the continent either. 50. Charles IX a puppet who did not know how to deal with the Protestant crisis. Controlled by his mother, he started out with a policy of appeasement and ended up allowing a massacre of the Huguenots in the royal wedding, beginning in practice a religious civil war. 49. Louis the Do-Nothing Cognomen gives it away. Not a lot to say about him. Last Carolingian king. 48. Carloman I Throughout his short reign, he spent most of his time either challenging the authority or competing against or trying to undermine his older brother, Charlemagne. In fact, the two were actually close to outright war. Eventually, it really didn't matter much, considering three years in, he conveniently dropped dead, supposedly of a nosebleed. Maybe it's just my cynical nature talking, but part of me suspects he was assassinated, even though there isn't proof of anything. 47. Charles the Simple A 20-year-long reign with ridiculous favoritism, endless Viking raids and lost crown authority. Pretty bad ruler. Killed his successor, though. 46. Robert I. Killed by Charles the Simple, nearly a year in. 45. Louis the Stammerer. Physically weak, short reign, easily swayed. Just not a good king. 44. Louis from overseas. He is given that cognomen because he came from England to rule France, even though he was actually born in France. Not that he was a particularly good king. 43. Louis the Sixteenth. To be fair to him, he did try to reform the French government through enlightened ideas. But because his measures meant the price of bread rose, followed by bad harvests, indebting the country by supporting the United States, the convening of the Estates General resulting in nothing at all, and the fact his wife was an Austrian, well, one revolution later and chop chop went his head. 42. Louis Philippe, the Citizen King Initially liked, but as time passed, socio-economic conditions worsened, leading to the 1848 revolution, and he quietly exiled himself to England. 
41. Charles X tried going back to rule by divine right, and effectively turned back the clock to before the revolution, not having got the memo that things had changed and they could not be undone. The result was exile. 40. Henry I, either seen as a weak king or a strong king limited by the monarchy's own power at the time. My take? He's just... meh. 39. Otto, not a Carolingian. He was okay, became king for defending Paris against the Vikings, but he did not amount to much. 38. Lothair, a very long reign marked by a rocky relationship with the Holy Roman Empire and the loss and attempts to recover Lotharingia. He started out pretty poorly, but gradually got better as his reign went on. 37. Philip VI. The cognomen of the fortunate has to be sarcastic in nature. This is the man who had to deal with the disastrous start of the Hundred Years' War, the estates refusing to raise money for him following this, and then cherry on top, he gets to deal with a Black Death. He was the man for, whatever reason, God hated specifically. 36. John I. This person was the French king for five days. This person was also alive for only five days. 35. Francis II. Died of poor health over a year into his reign. Not a lot to say about him. 33 and 34. Louis III and Carloman II. Their sort of joint reign started out very promising, with victories over the Vikings. Then Louis III hit his head and died after just three years on the throne. His brother Carloman would die two years later when he was accidentally stabbed in the leg by his servant in the middle of a chaotic situation when they were both attacked by a wild boar. Given Carloman survived a few days before dying, I can only assume the wound affected. This if he wasn't, you know, just plain murdered. 32. Charles VIII. The first French king to have to deal with pretty much being surrounded by the Habsburgs. Well, nearly. In truth, Francis I was the first one. His campaigns in Italy, which ultimately went nowhere, left France severely in debt. But hey, at least he was likable. 31. Hugh Capet the first of the famed Capet dynasty. His power was actually pretty limited and his reign was somewhat unremarkable. 30. Rudolf dealt with Viking raids and rebellions pretty effectively. As a medieval king, he was alright. 29. Henry III tried in vain to stop the religious civil war between the Catholics and the Protestants to no avail. In fact, his inability to produce an heir escalated the conflict into a war of succession between three factions. The third faction, should be curious, was the Politiques, aka Moderates. 28. Louis XVIII. He was an alright king. He was a constitutional monarch, not an absolutist, so really, he left the challenges of ruling to others. Though his reign did see a period of terror where the ultra-royalists ruled and purged plenty of Napoleon's supporters. 27. Philip the Fair. Infamous for destroying the Knights Templar after a series of mock trials. To be fair to him, Philip's objective throughout his reign was to reduce the power of the wealthy and nobility. And he did succeed in that, beginning a period of transition where France changed from a feudal country to a centralized modern state. I think he gets too bad of a reputation for being tyrannical, which, let's face it, he was. And I'm not just talking about the Knights Templar. Philip IV was tyrannical all around. From how he dealt with the Knights Templar, to his disputes with the church, to him arresting merchants who loaned the French state money. He was basically how I play Crusader Kings. Minus all the incest, of course. Still, I don't think he was a disaster of a ruler. 26. Charles Affair. Not a good king? Not a bad one either. His death without having a surviving male heir meant the French throne was to be disputed between Philip of Valois and the King of England, Edward III, starting the Hundred Years' War. 25. Philip I. Some romantic drama nobody really cares about aside, Philip was an overall pretty decent king, building up the military and royal power which had suffered some setbacks in his predecessor's reign. 24. Louis I. The son of Charlemagne. His reign is marked by internal strife as he struggled to maintain control over what his father had conquered, especially as his own family, most notably his own children, kept revolting. This was mostly due to his act of penance over the death of his nephew, one Bernard of Italy, as Louis had ordered his blinding, which ended up killing him. This penance ended up reducing his prestige and authority as a ruler, partly due to putting himself under a humiliating ordeal and partly for including a list of minor transgressions no ruler at the time would have bothered considering. A pity, then, that his military might was tested mostly by his children, I don't think he was bad and even salute him for his military record, but his overall inability to keep the empire together really puts him down. With his death, the Frankish Empire was divided into this abortion of a map. 
23. Louis VII participated in the Second Crusade, though this did not go well. Also, his inability to initially produce children ended up costing France some valuable territory, as his wife was the Duchess of Aquitaine, and she ended up marrying the King of England and had plenty of children with him. Oof moment right there. That aside, he was pretty alright. 22. Philip III. He is essentially like his father, Saint Louis IX, but less. A good diplomat and overall capable, though his attempt at conquering Aragon brought France to the edge of bankruptcy, which would leave his successor to face financial challenges. To be fair, it's not entirely his fault the Zentary erect his army. And him. 21. Henry II. Expelled the English from Calais and won some lands in what now is Alsace-Lorraine. He also intensified the persecution of the Protestants his father Francis I had started. Besides that, not a whole lot more to write home about. 20. Philip V. Pretty decent king who made some domestic reforms and compromised with Flanders. Shame he had a rather short reign. 19. Louis XIII. Focused in the arts and systemically destroying the French nobility. His reign also saw conflict against the Habsburgs, particularly the Spanish. 18th, Louis VIII. A good king, but his brief reign meant he ultimately had very little impact on France, though I can't deny his ability. 17. Louis X. In about a year and six months, he abolished slavery, emancipated serfs, re-admitted Jews into the kingdom, feuded with the nobility, and lost a war against Flanders. A pretty action-packed reign. 16. Louis XII. The father of the people. As you can see from his cognomen, he was really popular in his age. Of course, he was given this title for the great measure of lowering taxes. He also made some legal reforms and whatnot, but really, that was basically the reason. He was alright as a king though, nothing too special. 15. Francis I. For all you Anglos out there, he was a contemporary of Henry VIII. In fact, he was basically Henry VIII, but French, a warrior king interested in the Renaissance, and a firm Catholic to prove this piety by promptly allying with the biggest enemy of Catholicism at the time. But hey, it's diplomacy, baby. You gotta do what you gotta do. 14. Napoleon III. Mostly a good emperor. He achieved plenty of great things, such as founding the Second French Empire, reconstructed Paris, and effectively ended famines through establishing modern agriculture. But he had one major failing. His defeat at the hands of Prussia not only made France lose Alsace-Lorraine, it created Germany, a nation that, upon its birth, immediately overtook France as the premier land power in Europe. 13. Robert II. He increased royal power by quashing the nobility, introduced plenty of reforms, acquired the Duchy of Burgundy. A great king. 12. Charles V. Recovered much of the territory lost to the English during the Hundred Years' War. He also replenished the royal treasury and formed the first permanent army with regular wages. A great king, really. It's a shame his son was Charles the Mad. 11. Charles the Bold. The youngest son of Louis the Pious. I don't think he was bad. In fact, I think he was pretty good. But his overall unpopularity and constant enmity from his own brothers led to a decline of power in the monarchy. Also, he was very nearly deposed and the Bretons achieved a de facto independence. Pretty turbulent reign and a pretty good king, but a definite step down compared to his predecessors. By the way, it's been suggested his cognomen was given ironically and that Charles was not actually bold, but hairy. 10. Saint Louis IX. Reigned over an economic and political golden age of France. Expanded French territory, notably in Aquitaine, Maine and Provence, and made legal reforms, notably introducing the presumption of innocence to criminal procedures. Great diplomat as well. Had it not been for the ill-fated crusades which drove him away from France and even at a point led to his capture, he'd be higher. 9. Louis VI. A strong king, in fact often described as the first one since Charlemagne. He spent his rather long reign fighting either the Robin Barons in the area around Paris or the English over Normandy. This actually made the king so popular when the Holy Roman Emperor Henry V assembled an army in preparation for an invasion, the very barons Louis VI fought against sided with him. And in response, Henry V called the whole thing off. 8. Pepin the Short Became King of the France after deposing Hilderic III, the last of the Merovingians. His reign was marked by his military campaigns in Italy and in what is today modern France. In Italy, he essentially helped create what we know as the Papal States and furthering what already was by all aspects an alliance with the papacy. And in southern France, he kicked the Muslims out of the last little bit of land, Septimania. Then he turned on what was still a pretty much independent Duchy of Aquitaine and conducted an eight-year-long devastating war, eventually subduing the country. But he died still in that campaign, despite not having been defeated. Pepin the Short goes on in history as unquestionably a highly capable ruler, but happened to be overshadowed by both his father, Charles Martel, and his son, one Charlemagne. 
Also, his nickname is either a mistranslation, in which the younger became the short, or this cognomen was falsely attributed to him for being confused with another historical figure named Pepin. 7. Henry IV effectively ended the French wars of religion. Originally a Protestant, he converted to Catholicism and guaranteed religious freedom to Protestants, in order to secure his rule. Not that this actually worked, considering he suffered at least 12 assassination attempts. The last one succeeded. I do think he's a little overrated, but it does make sense considering he put an end to a decades-long era of division, and so it's fitting the French look at him as a symbol of union. 6. Louis the Prudent, also called, and I'm not kidding, the Universal Spider. This was due to his taste for intrigue and intense diplomatic activities. He formally ended the Hundred Years' War, though in truth his father Charles VII had already done so in practice, and he broke the spine of the Duchy of Burgundy. First by having the Duke of Burgundy, Charles the Bold, diplomatically isolated, and then by, in a stroke of good fortune, seeing Charles die in battle against the French. I'm still putting him below his father, which wouldn't be pleasing for Louis XI, considering he hated his stinking guts. 5. Charles VII Oh look, it's Seth Father, and probably the dark horse of this entire list. I mean, I wouldn't have expected him to make top 5 when I started this. The son of the worst king of France, Charles VII could not have been more different from his father. This is the man who won the Hundred Years' War, effectively expelling the English out of France and recovering much of the territory lost to the Burgundians. More impressively, he achieved this all the while by clearly not having a personality predisposed towards being a leader. Charles had to gradually grow into one. Furthermore, when his reign started, about half of France was in the hands of either the English or the Burgundians. He did not even have Paris and had to be crowned in Reims. Such a lousy starting position, and he won. One of the best kings France ever had. Oh, and he's also the Joan of Arc king, in case you're curious. 4. Louis XIV, the Sun King. Does this man need an introduction? With the largest recorded reign of any monarch of a sovereign nation, Louis XIV was a giant of his age. Continuing his predecessor's job, he sought to eliminate the remnants of feudalism and centralized power into the monarchy. L'état c'est moi. His reign saw France effectively overtaking Spain as Europe's premier power, and even if not totally eliminating the Habsburg rivals, his reign was one which, for the first time, at least in my mind, France was the stronger of the two. There are some gripes I have with Louis XIV. I do think absolutism ended up being a failure in any country not named Russia, and the War of the Spanish Succession left France in severe debt. However, I do think centralizing power was an absolute necessity at the time, and the severe debt was a natural price of winning a war, which strengthened the country's position, mind you. 3. Charlemagne Out of all medieval kings, THE medieval king. The man went on an absolute conquering spree, winning lands in Spain, Italy, Germany, and making much of Central Europe his tributaries. Along the way, he defeated the Lombards, the Basques, the Saxons, the Frisians, the Avars, the Slavs, and I could go on and on. He reformed currency, education, writing, politics, had a massive cultural and political impact in Europe for the next centuries, and was the model which monarchs base themselves for centuries to come, both in France and beyond. Charlemagne is a legend of European history, one of the greatest historical figures in the continent, and obviously, one of its greatest ruling monarchs. 2. Napoleon Not even considering his outstanding military record, Napoleon reformed taxation, currency, education, created the first French central bank, and most notably instituted the Napoleonic Code, which would serve as a legal basis in about a quarter of the world. Even to this day, in fact. It's arguable Napoleon's greatest act was his legal code. It's certainly what Napoleon himself thought. I don't think it's too far-fetched then, to consider Napoleon the father of modern France. And finally, what everyone knows about Napoleon is military prowess. If you go look for lists of the greatest military generals of all time, Napoleon is almost always in top 5 and very often as number 1. Which, in case you're curious, I agree. I do consider Napoleon to be the best military general of all time. In particular, I will always be amazed at Austerlitz, not for the general outline of the battle, but for Napoleon's decision to abandon the high ground before it. That just astonishes me. It's something I don't see myself ever doing, were I in his position. So, with all this in mind, you're probably wondering, why is he not number one? Well, the invasion of Russia. Good God, the invasion of Russia. As much as I like Napoleon as a historical figure, and I really do, this massive screw-up cannot be overlooked. The aftermath of this invasion left France exhausted, and really it's mostly his massive contributions in the long run that keeps him in contention 
for greatest French monarch of all time. There is in my mind, however, one who trumps him. Number one, Philippe Augustus. Consolidated royal power, financially stabilized the country, striked hard on his own rebellious vassals, and played a significant role in innovation and education on France, adding the Louvre as a fortress to the city of Paris, beginning the construction of the Notre Dame, and gave a charter to the University of Paris. Speaking of Paris, he built a wall around it. Most notably of all, he utterly broke the Angevin dynasty, which had sunk its claws deep in France. The Angevin controlled about half of France at this point, and Philip II reduced their holds to parts of Aquitaine. In turn, France was transformed into the most prosperous and powerful state in Europe under Philip II's leadership, and for having expanded the power of France so remarkably that Philip was given the epitaph of Augustus, a title befitting of Roman emperors. Hope you enjoyed the video. It took a while to make. Speed running an entire monarchical line can have its fun moments, as you find out about interesting historical figures, but admittedly it's pretty exhausting. It goes without saying this list is entirely subjective, and there are some positions you may raise your eyebrow on. I expect the general guy to think Henry IV is too low and Charles VII is too high, for example. Anyway, leave a like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.